On this episode of Pilot's Discretion, our guest is flight instructor and author Ryan Cook. He explains why it's hard to maintain instrument currency, how to use scenarios during flight training, and what he loves about the steerman. Pilot's Discretion starts right now. Welcome, everyone. I'm John Zimmerman, and thanks for listening to Pilot's Discretion from Sporties. It is IFR month at Sporties right now, a four-week celebration of the fun and challenge of instrument flying. Our goal is to help pilots get rated, get current, or get better. You can see all our articles, videos, webinars, and product specials at sporties.com slash IFR. Given that topic, I couldn't think of a better guest than the one we have today. Ryan Cook is an active instrument flight instructor, author, and aviation educator. When he's not flying or simming, both of which he does often, he is Director of Product Development at Pilot Workshops. I particularly value his perspective because it's usually focused on the way flying is done in the real world and not just the FAA textbook. Ryan, welcome to Pilot's Discretion. Thanks for having me, John. Let's begin with a philosophical question. Should more pilots get their instrument rating? From what I see, only about half of pilots have one. Is that too low? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a great idea for any pilot to pursue an instrument rating or at least look to get some of the skills that come with an instrument rating, whether you go all the way or not. Um, you know, people often think about an instrument rating as a tool that you can use to fly when the weather is really bad. And when it when it comes down to it, not many pilots, uh, you know, there, are, there just aren't many days where the weather is really bad. Even if you fly regularly, you're probably not flying approaches down to minimums very often. But the days where it's especially helpful are those days where, say, it's a couple thousand overcast, even even three or four thousand overcast. And, you know, you could go VFR. You maybe probably would go VFR, at least if you're in the Midwest here where it's pretty flat. Um, but it's just a, it's a tiring, um, higher workload sort of flight. And wouldn't it be nice if you could climb on top, get in this smooth, clear air on top and have a more relaxing trip. But it, so there's utility in it like that. There's also skills that you get from it that will apply to any flying you do, whether it's good VFR or hard IFR. And, um, you know, it's not the obvious ones either. It's the, it's the mental side of the game that comes with IFR, the professionalism, the discipline, precision, those things can apply to your day-to-day VFR flying in ways that make it, um, more, make, make you more comfortable, more confident and, um, uh, and, and open up sort of mental bandwidth that you didn't realize was available. Yeah, that's a great point that many people think IFR and they imagine slogging it out through ice all day and then shooting an approach to 200 and a half, which is just not the case, even even pro pilots. I mean, the majority of my time every year is flown under instrument flight rules, but a surprisingly low amount of that is actually spent in clouds. It's like you said, the day you, you need to climb through a 2,000 foot thick overcast and sit on top and you may not even shoot an approach. But I know that one thing that comes into play quickly with people, and maybe even one reason people don't get the rating, is the concept of currency and staying current, ideally proficient, but even just legally current seems to be a a major problem for instrument pilots. Estimates vary on this, but somewhere around half of instrument rated pilots are not legal to fly, never mind proficient. So it's a challenge. We can all understand that. What are some ways to stay current, maybe some non-obvious ways other than go out and fly three times a week? Are there other ways to build that proficiency mindset into your flying? Yeah, well, it's particularly easy to lose proficiency fly- to, pr- to lose proficiency in instrument flying compared to visual flying. I've always been kind of, it's, it's always kind of struck me as counterintuitive that when you're away from something for a while, the sorts of skills that atrophy quickest are not the physical ones. It's not the, the physical coordination stuff. You know, if you don't fly for six months and come back, you probably can still make a crosswind landing, uh, assuming you could for uh, but it's the mental game, the, the mental side, those skills that deteriorate when you're away. That's bad news for instrument pilots because that's 90% of the game there. Um, but in a way, it's also good news because those are the skills that you don't have to fly to practice. You can do a lot of that stuff at home, just keeping your head in the game. The obvious one is having a sim. You know, I think every instrument pilot should have at least access to a sim, whether it's a basic home sim or access to a flight school sim, commit to using that regularly. Um, But you don't even have to do that. You know, you can um, uh, just 
reading books and magazines, listening to articles, taking online training courses. I might have some ideas of which ones. Um, those those sorts of things help you keep your head in the game. And then just things as simple as, you know, grab your iPad, find an A to B flight in an area of the country that's interesting, maybe where you don't usually fly with interesting weather. Go through the exercise of planning it, chair flying it. Um, give yourself some what ifs as you go along. Um, just keeping your head in the game goes a long way. I couldn't agree more. I think that's overlooked by a lot of pilots that it's, it's particularly with instrument flying. There's such a mental game to it. And you're right about the iPad. There's it's not just a toy. There's a lot you can learn there. I, I find that what the first skill that goes for me is the basic instrument scan, just basic attitude instrument flying and keeping that scan going. And if it's been a while since I've flown IFR, it's not that it's gone, but it's just a little bit slower or a little bit rustier. So what are some some skills? habits or some skills we can practice as we're working on that instrument scan and those basic attitude instrument flying skills? Well, when it comes to basic attitude instrument flying, I think what was most revealing to me when I, when I started instructing was that uh, my scan wasn't as good as I thought it was. Uh, I picked up a lot of it on my own. Um, you know, back when I was a kid, honestly, flying flight simulators, I, by the time I got to actual instrument training, I had kind of a passable instrument scan. Uh, it could do the job, but you don't always realize, I think um, flight instructors sometimes misdiagnose problems later on in instrument training as procedural issues, but really the problem is that the student is just spending so much time on the scan, uh, but they're, but they're going to make that work. You know, they're not going to lose control of the airplane, so that takes up all their bandwidth, and then there's just not enough there to do the procedural stuff, but it comes across as a procedural issue. Um, so I think, you know, I've seen some experienced instrument pilots go back to basics on the instrument scan in a sim in particular, because that can be, you don't have your usual cues, which you're not meant, to, you know, physical cues that you're not meant to rely on, but they still tell you something's happening. They draw your attention back where it should be and, uh, and revisit those basics. The, the main one of those basics that I think is eye-opening to a lot of people is that the first step of the scan is practically enough to do the job. You know, if you set, if you know what sort of attitude, power, and configuration combination is going to get the job done, um, or have a good way of of estimating that, you're always going to be right in the ballpark. And then the rest of the scan, of course, you need more precision and um, redundancy than that for IFR flying. But it's just a matter of of um, checking and tweaking from there. That goes to something that I learned early on in instrument flying that was maybe not a cheat code, but a, a key insight for me, which was knowing what to expect in instrument flying is, is everything. It makes the whole thing easier. If you know what comes next on the procedure, if you know what ATC is probably going to say, if you know how the airplane will respond to certain power settings, you're just ahead of the game in, in so many ways. And as you alluded to, if you know your basic profiles, if I know that five degrees nose up, full power flaps up, you know that's my climb configuration, whatever it might be, I feel like you spend a lot of less, a lot less time chasing things. So how do you teach that as an instrument flight instructor? How do you teach, is it just experience or can you teach somebody to anticipate what might come next? Well, I think a lot of that is, uh, down to getting in the system as much as possible. I think the, one of the reasons that a lot of instrument pilots don't use the rating, like as soon as they get it, they're reluctant to use it is not necessarily to do with uh, inexperience flying in the clouds. I mean, that, that's part of it that many instrument pilots get the rating and have zero instrument time. And sometimes that's like, you know, I've done a lot of instrument training in Minnesota and Wisconsin in the winter. That's just, sometimes that's just how it goes. Um, that's part of it. But I think uh, a bigger issue is not getting much time in the system uh, because it, so often it feels like, you know, you've got a two hour slot. We could hammer out four local approaches and feel really productive. Or we could go somewhere with a more relaxed pace, like an actual instrument flight, file an actual, actual instrument flight plan, get in the system and, and do it that way. That's more productive. And you, um, you, know, you, you, you build a sense for what the next thing is when you're on an actual IFR flight. It's not rapid fire, what's the next bit of this procedure? It's let's, let's think a couple steps ahead. You know, you know, you... Um, the ATC side of it is, uh, is daunting for a lot of pilots, but once you've done it for a while, you realize that it's a script with a couple variations at each step, you know, so you, you kind of know what's coming. 
Yeah, Richard Collins always used to write about the two systems that IFR pilots fly in, and that's the ATC system and, and weather as sort of a global system. I think there's a lot of truth yeah. for that. If you're going to master instrument flying, you've got to really come to current terms with both of those systems. But your point about multiple approaches back to back is a real pet peeve of mine because I get it. That's an efficient way to train, but it's, it's has nothing to do with fly like you train and train like you fly. I know that's one of the things at pilot workshops you're really known for your mastery series, this monthly interactive scenario that gets debated and discussed by members and experts. And it's really focused on scenario training of a trip with a mission at an airport, which sets up those more natural flows. So what are some other ways that we can introduce that scenario based training concept, especially into instrument flying? Well, one thing that I like to do is solo cross countries in the instrument in the instrument rating and hear me out <laughs> um <laughs> i can hear flight instructors well, <laughs> shrieking in horror right now but I, I think i agree go ahead yeah so so when you're a, a brand new private pilot most brand new private pilots aren't reluctant to go out and fly because um because they've done it they've done it solo uh they know they they have some confidence that they can do it without someone in the right seat they've actually gone places uh, by themselves, built up some of a PIC mentality. And you just can't do that in instrument training um, for good reason. You can't send someone off on a solo cross country. And so you never really get that. And um, what I've done is uh, do solo cross countries in the sim uh, where you, so I'll, I'll assign a flight, you know, A to B to C and back or whatever it may be. And we'll say fly it tomorrow with tomorrow's real weather, whatever that happens to be. I mean, I'll look in advance and find something interesting. Fly it on the pilot edge network. So you've got live ATC each step of the way and do all the planning on your own. If you get stuck on something, figure it out on your own. That's the many mistakes you make are part of the process and uh, go out and do it. I did uh, an entire series of, of uh, an entire course of instrument training remotely on the sim this way with a friend of mine. And, um, in that case, he uh, he did these solo cross countries and he sent me the video. I watched them and then we got together for a debrief. And um, it gives you some of that same PIC experience, even though it's not real. Um, you know, if you haven't flown on the on the Pilot Edge network, you, you might be surprised when you when you key the mic. There's a little bit of that same anxiety. There's a, an accountability to it that you that you don't get otherwise. How about avionics and where this comes into play? That's an increasingly important part of instrument training. You're really unlocking the full use of the panel. When it comes to either glass cockpits or especially autopilots, how do you as an instrument instructor introduce that into the training program? When are you adding in different pieces of that technology and especially automation? I've evolved on this. This is something that Jeff N. West and I talk about a lot at Pilot Workshops, when this stuff should, should come in it used to be kind of taken for granted that you would start with minimal equipment and then add in the stuff as you got proficient on the basics. And I kind of think that we should lean the other direction and start with all the tools there, uh, understand how to, how to do, you know, you know, if you can look at, um, if you're tracking a course, say, and you can look at an HSI that's got a heading and a, and a track indicator on it, it's, it's, and a, and a wind vector, it's very obvious what you're trying to accomplish. Um, and then eventually you take that away and you can develop that. You can have the mental picture from, from having look, looked at it before. Uh, you know, and then when it comes to which courses, which sorts of courses you should be tracking in the beginning, traditionally it's, it's VORs and you do procedure turns and things like that. Um, but I think starting on GPS, the way that you're going to do it all the time and having track and desired track and cross track error and things like that available and, and learning that from the beginning is actually the way to go. Uh, Bruce Williams, I know you've, you've talked to him before. He starts with um, the very first lesson, as I understand, uh, using the autopilot. So, um, so the this, this student can see this is the attitude that the autopilot uses to make this work. This is the bank angle for a standard rate turn or whatever. And I think that's, that's a pretty clever idea too. Yeah, it's a very interesting approach that Bruce sort of brought me around on a little bit. I, I tend to agree with that. If you're flying a glass cockpit airplane in particular, and you haven't fully understood what that little magenta diamond is saying on the HSI in terms of your actual track versus your desired track and the wind vectors, you're missing maybe half the picture. 
Uh, and so, yeah, if you start with that, that full on version and then scale down, I think there's a lot there. I also personally see a lot of pilots yeah. who have very sophisticated autopilots in the airplane and no idea how to use it, which is just a waste because a, a, an autopilot can be a tremendous safety tool. It can also be a crutch, but if you, if you're trained on it properly, it can be a safety tool. So I just think it's a real loss when you have pilots flying around who don't know how to use it. Yeah. Yeah. My wife and I like to play, um, puzzle based video games together. And, um, those games, you know, essentially they're trying to teach you how, how to do something, how to solve these complex puzzles. And what they don't do is start with the complex puzzles and wait till you can do that and then make it easier for you. Uh, they start with the absolute, you know, they start with the basics, the easy, the, the easy stuff with all the, the handholding, right? So it struck me that, you know, the, the goal of a video game is, is essentially to teach you how to beat the game. That, that sort of thinking might, might apply to designing a flight syllabus. How about finding a good instructor? There's difference between, I think at least, a, a great primary instructor and a great instrument instructor. So if I'm someone who wants to really get the rating and use it and travel in an airplane, do you have any tips for finding an instructor who likes IFR flying and is, is willing to do some of these more advanced or real world, uh, scenarios? I think asking would be a first step, uh, getting a sense for whether a particular flight school goes out and gets in the clouds a lot. Um, and just, just ask is one, if you can, um, uh, I think there are, there are lots of good flight instructors who are brand new instructors who are excited about instructing, even if they're going to go to the airlines one day. So you shouldn't rule out those people, but if you can find somebody who's been, around for a while and specializes it and, and even, you know, does it part time. If, 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 if find an instructor that's doing it part time, uh, as a, as a side gig, it's probably because they really enjoy it. And if they really enjoy it, uh, they're, they're probably good at it. The other thing I'd add there is sometimes riding along with another current and active instrument pilot can be as educational as a formal lesson that even if you can't log it, uh, if you have the chance to ride right seat with somebody who does it a lot, I've, I've learned almost as much on some of those flights as a formal dual lesson where I'm sitting in the left seat. So maybe find the, yeah the grouchy old guy who flies, uh, you know, freight at night and ask if you can ride along one night. I think there's a lot to learn there. Yeah, no doubt. There are a lot of pilots who are not instructors who can, who can show you a lot of great things. Brian, let's take a quick break. And when we come back, I want to ask you some more about that remote instruction you did. You passed your private pilot check ride, and you might even have an instrument rating. Now what? Do you feel confident enough to use your pilot certificate in the real world? Sporties is proud to partner with Pilot Workshops to offer a selection of video courses and manuals that will improve your flying skills and build your confidence so you can get out and fly. Produced by Pilot Workshop's team of expert flight instructors and delivered in Sporty's easy-to-use pilot training app, these learning tools are packed with practical tips that go far beyond the textbook. Topics include airplane engines, IFR procedures, emergency strategies, communications, and more. Visit sporties.com slash pilotworkshops to learn more. Now, back to Pilot's Discretion. We are back with Ryan Cook, who has done a lot of instructing with flight simulators, but not in the typical way that you might think. So Ryan, first, tell me about the time you did an entire instrument rating syllabus remotely with a simulator. You alluded to this earlier, but w what was that process like and how realistic is that? Yeah, so this was a few years ago. Um, it was during COVID, so the remote aspect of it made sense. Um, and so what, what I did was a, uh, a friend of mine who's a private pilot, um, and uh, had taken an instrument ground school and everything. I knew his his knowledge was good, and we could jump right in with the flying. Uh, I, we set him up with a home simulator, and this was uh, it was running X Plane Eleven at the time. It had a touch screen panel and another screen for the out the window visuals. And we just took an instrument syllabus, adapted it a little bit for the sim, and went from lesson one all the way through to a check ride never in the same room together. I would be instructing from my basement office here and he, and he was in his, in his house flying, uh, just connected over team viewer so I could see all his screens and, uh, treated it, um, pretty much just like an actual course of instrument training all the way through to the end with, with, um, some of the, uh, 
uh, some adaptations to to the fact that we were doing a cinema course. Uh, and in the end, he took a check ride also remotely with a with a, a well known examiner, uh, and he passed the check ride. It was not an easy check ride. I can say he was he was as nervous as anyone going for any check ride, in part because he knew thousands of people were going to watch it as part of a pilot workshop uh, program. But it was uh, it was a really cool experience. Yeah. And in the end, his reward was an instrument rating with a uh, simulator only limitation. So it's a great idea. It's I, I feel like it's the next step that hasn't really been taking flight simulator software has advanced tremendously. And more recently, some of the hardware has really started to get quite good. And you add, as you said, the pilot edge piece to it, but it's still a somewhat singular venture. And so this concept of adding remote instruction to me is interesting. It'll be uh, it'll be quite something to see how that evolves over the years ahead. So how do you ensure a good remote instruction experience? Let's just say I want to do that. I have an instructor who's willing to do that. What are some tips that I should keep in mind, things to make sure I do or don't do if I'm going to try some remote simulator instruction? First of all, the things that it's that you can't do as an instructor is you can't take the controls. You can't uh, do anything with the radio. Um, so that means that the... The, the, the learner in this case, the, the student needs to, um, needs to be able to fly the sim, right? Uh, I did a lot of remote instructing through the pilot edge network too. And, and some of that was really great. A lot of it was, um, but the lessons that didn't really work out were the ones where they said, I want to fly this flight on the sim, but I don't feel quite up to it solo. So I'm going to bring an instructor with me and you know, I can't really intervene. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, as far as making it a good experience, I think a lot of the same things that you would do on a normal lesson are important. Get a good, get a good debrief. Um, get so get a good briefing in the beginning. Um, make sure you're on the same page about the flight. Uh, as an instructor, you want to be able to see. Uh, well, for IFR, obviously, you want to see the panel. You probably want to be able to see outside, and you definitely want to be able to see the iPad. Um, but we were able to use just Team Viewer for that to show all the screens at once and. Uh, it worked really well. Yeah. How good are Sims these days for avionics training? As I mentioned, that's, that's often a piece that comes into play here with instrument training and getting to know, a, you know, GTN 750 or G1000 or something. How accurate yeah. and useful are those for training these days? Yeah. Avionics are always the tough part with Sims. Um, there's, there's two ways that avionics are typically represented in a Sim. One is an emulation. So the creator of this avionics package just created it from scratch and tried to duplicate the real thing as closely as possible. And those are um, usually the better ones are, are good enough if you've already used the real thing. And you'll notice the little differences here and there. So that's like the, you know, like the stock GPSs in Microsoft Flight Sim and, and X-Plane are, are made that way. Uh, and then there are some avionics that are actually using, for example, the Garmin trainers and getting those to be driven by the SIM. Um, and he, both X-Plane and, and Microsoft Flight SIM have versions of that available from third parties now. And those work exactly like the real avionics, uh, with the one issue being that the, the databases are usually out of date because you're stuck with whatever's in the trainer. So, so you can get a good experience with the GTN in the SIM where it might not match your exact setup is, um, is the rest of the panel. The way a GTN behaves depends on what it's connected to. If you're connected to a pair of G5s, for example, uh, you get auto slewing. Um, you may get the full VNAV capability. You may be able to couple your autopilot to it, and you might not be able to duplicate all that in the sim. So you might be stuck with a GTN and a steam gauge panel, depending on what you're flying, which is going to have its own subtle differences from what you're flying, but certainly close enough that you can practice with it. And I think... Um, you know, I know you've spoken with people who have said this before, and I would I would agree that you shouldn't obsess over getting an exact match of your airplane and your panel. Get it reasonably close, go with it, treat it as its own airplane. Then you've got your your real plane and your sim plane, and uh, you know, not, a ninety five percent match gets you ninety nine percent of the way there in terms of of uh, practice value. Now, I know you helped start a high school aviation program that taught an abbreviated private pilot syllabus in a sim. What did you learn from that experience? Yeah, so this is in Wausau, Wisconsin. The program's still running, although I haven't been involved with it in the last few days, last few years. Uh, but uh, yeah, I helped design the syllabus for that. It's a, uh, I think it's a sixteen lesson 
private pilot syllabus that goes through everything that's on a normal private pilot syllabus, but in an abbreviated way. And it's all done in the sim. Um, you know, it starts with just the, the very basics. These, these most, uh, most of these high school students haven't been in a, an airplane before. So they're introduced to the basics in the sim. And then by the end, they're flying cross country flights in the sim. Um, and, uh, and, and many of them, most of them, I think go on to then start flight training and they're, they're well ahead of the game at that point. And, uh, you know, I, th- I think as long as you have a, an instructor who's competent in sim instruction, you can at least warn them about some of the, the common, um, bad habits that you might pick up from a sim. You know, you start right away with, we're going to cover up the instrument panel and you're going to set an attitude here. And, and now let's check it and see what kind of performance we get. Yeah, the specific sight pictures are going to be different in the sim, of course, than they are on the plane, and the control pressures and all that are completely different. But if you can ingrain those concepts from the start, then you can you can short circuit some of those some of those bad habits. One thing that I've found with the the sim first sort of training is that you can do it without as many compromises as you would in a real airplane. You know, you don't you don't have to say, "Well, I'd really like to fly." at this interesting airport, I don't want to always have to start at my home airport. Well, you don't have to in the sim. You know, you can go chase an interesting weather or interesting airspace or whatever. You can set up, you know, I want an eight-knot crosswind component. Well, you got it. So yeah, I mean, I think that's that program has been a real, a real success there. Ryan, we always like to close with our lightning round. We call it ready to copy. So I'll ask some semi-random questions and you fire back with a quick answer. Are you ready to copy? Ready to copy. What's a simple habit that good IFR pilots should use? Uh, well, one thing I think is checklists are really important for IFR. And people don't do them because they're inconvenient, because they're, they're more work than they're worth. Um, you know, if you've got your checklist stashed in a side compartment, you got to pull it out and flip to the right page, you're probably just not going to do it. So what I do is I have my checklist on ForeFlight on a separate tab. That tab is always available, so it's always one touch away. And I also put all of my in-flight checklists onto a single checklist. So rather than having separate ones for climb and cruise and descent and landing, it's one in-flight checklist. So it's just a single touch. I'm at my in-flight checklist. You know, I've already done the things. I've done the flow or whatever. Quick verify with the checklist and, and back to the next thing. That's a great one. My personal two are always brief every approach and call out thousand feet to go in climbs and descents. But there's probably six or eight that a good instrument pilot would use. Agreed. How about how about this one? Should an average GA pilot ever do a circling approach for real in IMC? I think it depends on what the weather actually is. Because if it's, you know, 1500 overcast or something with good visibility and you just use the approach to get below the clouds, it's just a normal traffic pattern there. Uh, if it's actually something closer to circling minimums, if you're doing it in low visibility, then yeah, that's probably something to stay away from. So if you limit yourself to say, I'm only going to circle at normal traffic pattern altitudes, maybe 1800 or sorry, 800 AGL is my absolute lower limit for circling and I need good visibility. Then I think it's reasonable. It's just a traffic pattern. What's the most antiquated thing about flying IFR in 2024? Well, I think one of the obvious answers is paper charts. You know, if you can get away, get away from paper charts, even as a backup, it's just, just better to have everything on, on devices. Um, but I think that the next evolution of that is, you know, why are we using digital representations of paper charts even on our devices? And, um, you know, if I'm flying an approach, there's probably a, a handful of transitions and a bunch of minimums and a bunch of notes that I don't really care about, but they're all on the chart. And um, you can get some of that, uh, you know, you can, you can pare some of that down by doing things like, loading the approach into the flight plan on for flight using the procedure advisor and that'll give you just the courses and transitions that you choose and the minimums that are appropriate to your plane and everything else is gone and it's nice and clean and just the information you need yeah you're preaching to the choir on that one if we invented approach plates today they would not look like they do now you would get information in context and when you need it so amen on that Here's a debate I heard recently between two flight instructors. Do we cancel too many flights? I heard one flight instructor complaining basically that we teach students how to cancel flights, but we don't teach them how to make flights. So is there a balance we should seek there or is that asking for trouble? I think there's probably some truth to that. You know, there's flight instructors sometimes have the same 
issue with getting experience in IMC and in the ATC system as students do. It's just it's just not that easy to come by sometimes if you're not going out there uh, and and seeking it out. Uh, one of the things that when we make scenarios at pilot workshops is really important is acknowledging that pilots, you know, the pilot in the specific scenario or pilots in general have reasons for making flights. You know, there's it, it, safety isn't everything. It's obviously important, uh, but pilots also want to get a certain amount of utility out of their airplanes. And uh, it's it's one thing to always just say it's, it's better to be on the ground wishing you were in the air than vice versa. Um, but I think, you know, we have to, if you're actually going to be a proficient pilot at doing the instrument stuff, you've got to get out and do it. Should the FAA allow more simulator time for the private pilot certificate? Right now you can log some, but not much. And most people don't. Should that be increased? I'm not sure. I can, I can certainly see the value of it. I mean, I've seen firsthand how uh, pilots that do a lot of sim time uh, pick things up much quicker when they get in the airplane then. But I also, I don't think it matters so much at this stage because, you know, how many, how many private pilots finish up with 40 hours or are ready, ready in less than 40 hours anyway. And if they are, it's probably because they're doing something like using a sim or just anything to keep their head in the game, studying a lot, flying a lot. They're doing the extra things. So uh, maybe, maybe we should be able to count more sim time towards the private, but I, I don't think it matters a whole lot either way. You're still saving hours by doing the sim time. The sim industry has long said it's not about the time you log, it's about the time you save. And I do think that's very true. So, yep, I agree. You've got some time in a Stearman, which is a legendary airplane, a bucket list airplane for lots of pilots. So for someone who's never flown in one, what's the most interesting or surprising thing about jumping into an open cockpit Stearman? Well, I have, I think, about three hours of dual received in the Stearman. And <laughs> uh, it's, it's in Wausau, Wisconsin. John Schmiel offers uh, instruction in a bright orange Stearman. And um, if you go there, and even if you're not a pilot, you, you'll, you'll fly it. It's, he doesn't give rides. He gives experiences. <laughs> and... Um, you know, the coolest thing about flying the Searman, if you haven't done the open cockpit thing, that's just a, it's just an incredible experience. Um, it's probably kind of like you picture it being. Uh, the Stearman specifically, it, great visibility everywhere you look, except for where you feel like you probably want to look, which is straight ahead. So that's something to get used to. Um, it's uh, a little bit uner unnerving to be, um, you know, having to fly a, a curving approach to final just to see the runway or a slip on final just to see the runway and then trust that it's still there when the nose is in the way. Um, and of course that's a, you know, a lot of tailwheel airplanes are like that. The steerman definitely is from the back seat. Um, and then, uh, you know, you're flying a plane that people trained for world war two in. So how cool is that? Right. Absolutely. A great looking airplane, great sounding airplane. Yeah. A dream for a lot of people, certainly for me. So you worked in software development before coming to pilot workshops. You've got some background there. What's a concept from that world that applies to aviation? One way that I think programming might um, relate to flight instruction is that it's it's a uh, you have to be you have to think very literally as a as a computer programmer. You know, you the computer will do exactly what you tell it to do. It's not going to just sort of catch your drift and and fill in the blanks for you. Uh, although with AI, that's changing a bit. Um, and it, it, if you, you relate that to flying with a brand new primary student who has no experience in an airplane, I can think of one of my first students on her first lesson. Uh, you know, we, she had never been in a plane before. And I told her, OK, let's try it. Let's try a little turn to the right. So, you know, turn, turn the oak to the right and make a gentle bank to the right. OK, that's steep enough. That's OK. Stop. Stop. <laughs> It's getting steeper and steeper, and it's because I did, I never said that to to stop you know to stop increasing the bank you stop turning the yoke, and so sometimes you have to be to remember that people have have um, don't have the same background as you and uh, be very literal sometimes. We always like to go outside aviation, so I know you play guitar in a band, which seems to be popular option among a lot of pilots I know. So if you could play guitar with any guitarist, living or dead, who would it be? Who do you want to go on stage with? Uh, when I was in high school, the band that inspired me to buy a guitar and, or sorry, join a band and then buy a guitar in that order was <laughs> U2. And so I would love to, to play with the edge. Go on stage at the Sphere in Las Vegas in front of a sold out crowd, right? Right. With no eyes on me 
So that would, that would probably be good. So you're from Wisconsin, as you mentioned, and that's a place that for a lot of pilots means Oshkosh in July, but there are 12 months in the year and there are lots of places in Wisconsin other than Oshkosh. So if I'm going to fly to the Badger State outside of July, what's an interesting place I should put on my list? Yeah, if you've only been to Wisconsin for an air show, you might be surprised that it's not always hot and muggy and stormy in Wisconsin. Um, uh, Door County is a place I like to go to. That's the peninsula between Green Bay and Lake Michigan. That's a neat little airport's there, and it's scenic. Uh, southwest Wisconsin, like the La Crosse area, you've got the Bluffs and the Mississippi River. That's a cool place to fly to. Yeah, it's a beautiful state, actually, for anyone in the Midwest. I think Wisconsin's got some great flying up there. All right, Ryan, our last question is always the same on pilot's discretion. You have one final flight. We want to know what are you flying and where are you going? Well, I would fly my simulator. <laughs> not, not really. Uh, first, I thought of this in terms of like bucket list flights that I, that I haven't done. Um, but I, I kept coming back to, I think what I would actually do is just a sunset local sightseeing flight i'd have to bring the family with um but those are some of the best flying memories i have are just you know it's a beautiful evening let's go fly don't think it would matter too much what plane it was ryan thanks for being on the podcast thanks for having me thanks for listening to pilots discretion brought to you by sporties training and equipping pilots worldwide for over 60 years for more episodes and today's show links visit sporties.com slash podcast. I'm John Zimmerman. We'll see you next time on Pilot's Discretion.